Hi, and welcome back to the lecture here in Cultural Anthropology, Anthro 102. We are now on to week 10, and as you might guess, we're getting close to closing out the class here with uh, two remaining weeks and focus on really some of those capstone issues or contexts or approaches that define, I think, the most contemporary period of anthropology. And I think that's true in two senses. One, we're talking about issues that are really pressing issues, including that of the Anthropocene, the idea of the human impact on the environment, concepts related to globalization, sustainability, and really the future of our planet, of our various cultures around the world. And secondly, it's the most contemporary moment of anthropology, particularly as we get into week 11 and we talk about applied action and public anthropology, where we're really focusing on this ideal of moving anthropology beyond its theoretical moment and focusing on applications. And this is one of these points in the class where I would encourage you to think very critically because there may be some approaches or contexts or issues we discussed this week that perhaps collide with the notion of cultural relativism, what we talked about earlier in the quarter, respecting other cultures. When we get to this moment of capitalism, when we get to this moment of the Anthropocene and we think about how we're having this impact on the planet, can we any longer defend, if we did defend, a capitalist consumer society? And as we move into this globalized realm as well, what do we think about homogenization and the stamping out of cultural differences as we become more and more, quote, one planet, perhaps in terms of media, information, technology, finance, and even maybe language. But then we see, unfortunately, the d diminishing or the wiping out of certain cultures and approaches out there that don't fit in with this kind of globalized terrain that we're talking about. So this is really a good, great opportunity this week and next week to get into some of the most pressing and controversial and critical issues that you'll cover in the world of cultural anthropology. Let's begin this week then by looking at our week 10 module. You're going to see two different chapters and sets of topics to cover. I really though would encourage you to think of these two chapters as a combination and when you get into the media and the additional reading you'll see that really there's so much overlap between what we're talking about. We'll begin though with chapter 12 and that is the chapter on globalization. So these are the different learning objectives considered here in the globalization chapter. So be very familiar with those of course as typical. We'll go on to the reading now and let's open up chapter 12 in our text. You see the learning objectives repeated here again. And this is kind of interesting. It's talking about um, maybe a typical lunch you would have in your campus in a dining hall. Not every school, including ours, we don't have a cafeteria. But they're trying to use this as an example to talk about how you get um, many different foods from around the world. But at the same time, there's a question about whether or not um, certain foods are authentic or what about um, certain foods maybe that raise issues of appropriation of other cultures. And so there's kind of a social justice topic here as well. And in fact, when we talk about globalization, we'll really raise this issue about social justice and say, is it the case that as we're becoming more of a global scene in terms of world cultures coming together, that we're seeing massive forms of social injustice taking place? So you get a very good overview here of what globalization is, and this is a great paragraph to look at right here. As they say here, globalization is a word that's commonly used in public discourse, but it's often very loosely defined in today's society, not unlike the word culture itself, and we've talked about that in the past. As they say here, globalization now is commonplace to discuss the circulation of goods, the fast and furious exchange of ideas, and the movement of peoples. Despite its common use, it seems that many people are using the term or not defining it in the same way, and that's certainly the case with culture as well. Some treat globalization only as an economic issue. Others might treat it as a technological or media issue. I would say it's all of these. When you get into Arjuna Pottery's notions of the different scapes, that really emphasizes that in the era of globalization, it's the combination of all these forces and forms. It's technology. It's travel. It's now global disease as we're talking about the pandemic. That's a kind of an unfortunate side of globalization due to, say, global travel and global commerce. It's also, of course, media and technology. It's all that kind of stuff that we see in all the screens of our everyday lives that really emphasize globalization, even though we're not necessarily thinking about it, maybe as we would in the anthropology class here. 
So um, Steger's definition of globalization is pretty good. It's called, or it refers to the intensification of worldwide social relations that link distant localities in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring miles away and vice versa. So globalization really says that because you can watch a media broadcast from anywhere in the world, you can broadcast yourself from anywhere in the world, you can travel all over, over the world, economic systems that happen or take place in one part of the world reach other parts of the world. The clothes that we wear, in fact, might be designed in the U.S., but maybe the clothing is made in Mexico. It maybe might be made in Bangladesh or China. And that becomes that issue of globalization impacting and connecting everyone around the world for better or for worse. They talk here about the tradition of colonialism and global empires. So certainly we see the case with the Ottoman Empire, uh, Chinese dynasties, the Roman Empire, where you're really setting up shop, if you will, all over the world. We, of course, come from the colonialist legacy here in the United States in terms of uh, the British Empire. But it's maybe something we don't think about. And what I would say today is, even though the empires of the past had radical impacts on cultures and totalities and entities and territories out there in different parts of the world, what we're doing today has a very unique impact on the world in that sense of the Anthropocene when we talk about how we have an impact on other parts of the world, even if we don't see it, even if those impacts are invisible in terms of what we call an externality, which we'll talk about as we discuss sustainability. So this is a really great opportunity to look at both kind of the early influences on globalization as well as anthropological theory. In fact, in colonialist um, contexts, we saw anthropologists were often collaborating with colonists and were trying to appease, if you will, the indigenous people and allow the colonists to settle and control those colonies by maybe helping to control those people. So there's certainly a rather nasty colonialist legacy that we have to address in anthropology as well. Now here's this really good stuff. So the work of Arjun Apadurai, who's been so influential in terms of his studies of the global picture connected to anthropology. So Arjun Apadurai discussed five scapes. So just like the word landscape, scape is kind of a territory that goes across and connects different parts in that territory. There are five specific scapes or flows. There's the ethnoscape, the technoscape, the ideoscape, the financescape, and the mediascape. And as they're saying here, thinking of globalization in terms of people, things, and ideas that flow across natural boundaries is a really productive framework for understanding the shifting social landscapes in which contemporary people are often embedded in their daily lives. So you can log on today. I just saw there's a new feature on Twitter that is an audio feature that allows you to listen in on these rooms. Literally, someone in, in, I was going to say China, but there's actually censorship that happens in some countries. So in a country, let's say somewhere in Europe, someone could be logged in, you could be logged in at the same time, and in a sense, you could be sharing across this technology or technoscape that Apoderai talks about in ways, again, that maybe we didn't intend in the past. We don't even consider some of these ways to be facets of globalization, but they certainly are. One of my encouragements for you this week is to really think about how you're connected to other people across the world. We all come from different places. Not all of us were born in the U.S., and that's the exciting thing about taking a class in today's day and age of distance education is you can actually meet people from across the world and learn about new cultural traditions as we're doing here in this class. And indeed, that's maybe for me the most positive aspect of globalization, the fact that you can meet people from across the world, participate with them in media scapes, if you will, and Zoom or these other methods that we use today, even musical um, and uh, performance context that we've talked about in the last few weeks. And that allows us to see all the enriching diversity and different cultural traditions that are out there and that we should celebrate. And, and certainly we should do that in this era coming out of the Trump presidency in 2020, 2021, where there was so much emphasis on attacking and putting down other cultures, referring to, and these are the president's words, shithole cultures in Haiti and in Africa and so forth. So I think the positive side of globalization could be some of those cultural interminglings and connections that in the past were not always as possible because we didn't have the systems of travel, technology, communication, finance, and even language and translation that we do today. So we can now look at more depth in terms of the five scales that a Potterai talks about. So the ethnoscape refers to the flow of people across boundaries. So you think about even in Lake Tahoe here, where people are brought in from Poland and other countries 
to work, in some cases, albeit unfortunately, as low-paid labor in some of our casinos. So there's recruitment that goes on for our local soccer teams, which is really great. And we bring in students from all over the world, and then they might play soccer at Lake Tahoe Community College or another community college on the West Coast, and of course, all across the United States. So it's that flow of people using that word ethnicity sort of as the root there. Again, you can differentiate between all of these because they all have scape on the end and then the uh, suffix or root word in the front that really defines what kind of globalization uh, terrain we're talking about. Of course, then the technoscape refers to the flows of technology across the world. The iPhone is one example of how the movement across uh, boundaries can radically affect day-to-day -day work for people. We've talked here, I think you've read about this in the past, where in some of the iPhone factories, we... Um, have heard about really bad labor conditions. If you click on any of these links, of course, as you know, it'll take you up to um, one of these um, opportunities to read more in depth about that particular issue. So this is one example where certainly we have a lot of concern about the context or the consequences rather of our consumerism. If we're using certain phones or certain brands or certain forms of technology, and we're not aware of these consequences. Again, it's an opportunity to really educate ourselves about what's happening across the world via globalization. The third scape here is an ideoscape. This is the flow of ideas. Could be small scale, such as an individual posting personal views on Facebook, as I talked about earlier with Twitter. It could even be larger and more systemic. Missionaries are an example around the world where a missionary would try to spread Christianity or a particular form of, say, the gospel or religion to another culture. Very controversial, of course, but a lot of people identify with this because they say it's our opportunity to kind of teach people about the teachings of our religion and maybe they'll kind of jump on the bandwagon, if you will. So the ideoscape could be religion, it could be technology, it could be, of course, a form of, say, economic system kind of merging with political systems like capitalism, which as we get into neoliberalism this week, kind of this new mode of the capitalist um, free market that kind of marches across the world. It's an example of where economics, politics, technology, even media can collide with one another, combine with one another. So you certainly would want to look at all of these scapes as they relate to one another. They're not like distinct. They're all connected. And that's one of the parts of globalization that is interesting and also challenging to, to study anthropologically. The finance scape refers to the flow of money across political borders. This is Some of this is even written before the big push in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is an example of other tendencies of globalization where literally currency is being mined and stored and reproduced on all these blockchain connections across the world on various computing systems. And then the mediascape is one that's particularly important for me in my research. That's the flow of media across borders. In earlier contexts, as they mentioned here, it might have taken weeks for entertainment, education, media, travel from one location to the other, uh, the telegram and the telephone, for example. Now in the world of the internet, again, censorship in certain countries and cultures and localities, of course, defines some of this differently from place to place. So we shouldn't assume that just because globalization is this sort of onslaught and interconnection of everybody across these five scapes that Apoderai talks about, then necessarily you don't have local context. And in fact, anthropologists, for example, who have studied, there's a really good collection called Global Arches East that's all about McDonald's as a globalized entity moving into Asian cultures, but how McDonald's gets adapted locally. So one thing you can't forget is for all the homogenization and similarity that happens via these scapes of globalization that Apaterai and others talk about, you have local contexts that similarly and importantly define how that adaptation is taking place in, in local situations. So actually very specific to this issue of how a local culture or a territory place context might adapt in terms of globalization, we have the concept of geolocalization. So you can think of this as the way in which something global is adapted at the local, as they say here, palatable forms. And they give the example of McDonald's across the world. As I mentioned, the book Golden Arches East really talks about this context. And I think it's one of the more interesting aspects of studying globalization, as we'll get to at the end 
end of the chapter. In terms of doing your own research projects, you might think about some ways in which you could study a global commodity, brand, a form, a tradition even, and how it becomes localized and adapted at that local individual level or local cultural level. You can also look at the case study of salsa dancing around the world. I mean, dance is, as we talked about in the performance chapter, one of those uh, art forms that is super popular across the world if you look at all the celebrity dance shows and different dance traditions out there. So a great example of how adaptation happens there. The next section of the chapter focuses on lifestyle taste and conspicuous consumption. So here we're looking at specific contexts in which people consume, including ourselves, of course, in our own unique uh, senses, and how that connects to lifestyle, which we could call the creative, reflexive, and sometimes even ironic ways in which individuals perform various social identities. In some of my own research, as you'll get a chance to read this week or in other weeks, I actually talk about how social justice might connect to issues of consumption and concepts of social identity, conspicuous consumption, lifestyle, and taste. So a really good section to look over. It's told here, discussed in the context of globalization. The concept of habitus is mentioned here. This is actually from the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, and he talks about this sort of as the affective or enculturated ways in which we all express ourselves in terms of social class identity. So whether you watch uh, PBS or another TV station, whether you enjoy monster truck races or going to the opera. And it's not to say that one or the other is better or worse or higher or lower class. That's actually a, um, an issue of cultural relativism that we'd, we would want to encounter and really uh, contradict and, and challenge. But it is interesting to think about how many of our consumption and lifestyle choices are often based on this concept, which could connect to our upbringing as well as our social class. There's a really good section here talking about globalization in everyday life. And as you can see, there could be pro or anti-globalization, although it's probably, as they suggest here, more of a continuum across the board. And it's not like one or the other, maybe as we sometimes think. We might talk about conditions in the global north and also the global south. And I think one of the contexts of globalization that is really key to consider is this idea of whether our consumption practices in our own local context have an impact on other parts of the world. This has been an issue, as we discussed in the chapters on economics and subsistence, connected, say, to um, consumption of coffee beans and how maybe some people are interested in more eliminating the middleman and the branded side of, say, coffee consumption and focusing instead on fair trade practices. So a lot to consider, certainly, in this section as you get into it. And uh, the everyday life context, I think, is super interesting about this. We also can talk about disadvantages of um, the intensification of globalization. So as we've talked about before, there are definite impacts on certain parts of the world, depending on the situation, depending on the level to which people in those places have money or not, their gross domestic product or GDP versus, say, the United States. And of course, there are many poor people in the United States as well. But I think it's interesting to think about from the context of globalization, how maybe we forget about certain parts of the world, uh, parts of the world that suffer because of the specific context of these scapes and globalization that we've been talking about this week. And it's interesting here talking about the context of the Donald Trump presidency as well as the Brexit vote. I remember teaching right before the vote was taken and I was asking some of my students from the UK how they thought it was going to go. And uh, just I think a lot of shock for some people to see that there would be, be this movement to leave the European Union. And this sort of backlash that we're talking about here, whether it's people in the US voting for Trump or perhaps people voting in the UK to leave the EU with the Brexit vote, there could be an indication that this is kind of like a backlash of some of the uh, wealth gap issues that we see, as they say here, even in some of the rich countries. So it's, I think, important to consider this because it'll continue to be an issue here going forward in future elections, not just in the US, but across Europe and, and much of the world, I would imagine. Now, there's a discussion of neoliberalism if you want to know what neoliberalism is, the basic definition is it's a market-driven market economy. It's an economy focused on the idea of competition, of the unfettered, unchecked market, and often focused on practices of consumption. And 
valuing everything in terms of market identities or market context or market movement and so forth. So it's something that has concerned a lot of people, certainly on the left, in terms of how neoliberalism has impacted the global scene and how we're moving maybe more towards this one world economy that could suggest to us some real challenges in terms of the poor and um, indigenous cultures being left behind. So you can look over this entire section. I'm not going to cover it in depth, but a lot of great discussion of the Latin American context that you can certainly read. And um, try to understand this more in the picture of how specific parts of the world are impacted by the consumption practices and lifestyles of us and other people in the world. You can look at privatization and the Bolivian water crisis, I think is a really good case study. I've given you some additional context to consider in media this week. And then we can also talk about responses to globalization. So syncretism refers to a tradition in which you take two more different traditions, combine them together, and create kind of a harmonious whole. So it's an interesting idea, not unlike geolocalization, of how local cultures can adapt and really combine aspects of one or more cultures together, which could suggest some uh, positivity in terms of saying that your overlapping frameworks and people clearly could come together in some ways. Products could come together. Patterns of culture could come together in some ways that maybe suggest uh, positive aspects of globalization. You could also look at alternative markets. We've talked about in other chapters about the um, idea of feral trading of people going beyond, above and beyond, or um, you know, underneath, if you will, the traditional market economy, the neoliberal kind of economy that we're talking about here. You can also see that, say, maybe in cryptocurrency, which could be an example of this. There are other examples out there. The um, NFT, the non-fungible token, is, is kind of interesting in the art world. You could ask some questions about what that implies for maybe conversations here about trade and artists being able to define digital rights in this new world that is is definitely interesting for all of us, not just um, anthropologists for sure. Now some implications for anthropology. So what might anthropologists do to study these global flows of money, people, technology, ideas, and so forth? One context certainly is urban anthropology, and I think there's a focus in urban anthropology on a lot of these examples, if you go to major cities over the all over the world, you see brands, you see technology, you see media forms, you see commerce, travel, of course, tourism, all combining in an urban form. You certainly see that in rural um, examples as well, or context. In my own research on popular culture, I've looked a lot at these contexts, and I have a chapter focusing specifically on how the theme park industry and theming in general has impacted urbanism. And this was for a reader that was done on um, urban studies. The global demand for quinoa is interesting. I think it's one of these crops or products that became really kind of a bobo crop where people were interested in quinoa. And so it's created some um, issues across the world in terms of demand. We're seeing this right now, by the way, with COVID. If you are watching this in 2020, 2021, a lot of conversations about disruption of the global supply chains, um, a lot of groceries going up in price all throughout uh, the US. The UK has experienced shortages where you have empty shelves. When COVID first hit, we saw toilet paper and sanitizer and gloves and all kinds of masks and stuff disappearing from shelf stores. And it's gotten a little bit better since the first wave of COVID hit and we first started going into a quarantine and so forth. But it's interesting to think how a global pandemic as well has impacted through this global context we're talking about today, the supply chain across the world. The other big one is computer chips. Here in 2020, 2021, a lot of shortages across the world affecting all these sorts of devices that use chips and that um, is in a great demand right now and is experiencing uh, conditions of shortage. Now, when we talk about how we conduct research. There's a conversation here about multi-sided ethnography. Um, one of my dissertation advisors, George Marcus, wrote a very important piece and a book talking about multi-sided ethnography. So the idea would be that you would actually look at not just one site, because in the global picture that we're talking about today, it's a mul multiplicity of field sites. So you would look at multiple locations and then talk about how to connect those locations. And what George Marcus talks about is the idea of different themes that allow people to connect these various field sites. <laughs>
And then the chapter ends with this conclusion, and they suggest here, which might be a good jumping off point for our discussions, that globalization is neither good nor bad, but it's a facet of life today. It's a fact of life. And uh, it's definitely, I think when we look at it, there could be positives and negatives. I know in classes I've taught specifically on the theme of globalization, I always did try to provide that balanced perspective. So my encouragement for you would be to also think of it in this very balanced sense. And as I said, apply it to your own everyday life context as you think about how maybe anthropologists might look at globalization this week here in week 10 of the class. Okay, so that is chapter 12. We'll move on now to chapter 14. And this is focused on what we call the Anthropocene or the Anthropocene, however you want to pronounce it. And this gives you the context of the chapter and what's being discussed once we get into the actual chapter. I think you'll get some really good considerations of what this concept means. So you could think of it, this in the sense that we talk about geological periods. So we talk about the Holocene or the Pleistocene. And so it's an epic um, spelled E-P-O-C-H, of the earth. And the reason that people started to talk about the Anthropocene is the idea that this is the one era of geology and, and time on this earth that is really impacted by one species, and that is Homo sapiens, that is us. As they say here, talking about this, all sorts of climate impacts are happening right now, and we realize through the holistic perspective in anthropology that all these interactions, particularly the ones we talked about in the last chapter on globalization of politics, of culture, of economics, connects back to this biocultural perspective that we talked about with our chapter on medicine and anthropology, and this idea of sustainability. The idea specifically that our lifestyles as homo sapiens are becoming unique and so unique in a negative sense that they're impacting all the other species and ecosystems on the planet. And that's why we talk about this idea of the Anthropocene, this notion that this is the unique era of human inhabitation of this particular point in time in which we're existing now. Now, the idea of anthropology looking at environment and sustainability goes back many years, well prior to when we talked about this era of the um, Anthropocene. In fact, a lot of people in the traditional frameworks in the 60s and 70s were doing environmental anthropology, and it wasn't necessarily at the time always focused on political engagement as we're talking about in these last two weeks of the quarter, but often was focusing on how people existed, to go back to our subsistence chapter, how people existed in tandem with other species in the environment. So for example, in a pastoralist uh, society like among the Maasai in Africa, you might have an anthropologist studying the relationship of people, cattle, and the land. And that itself is a really great opportunity to study what we call environmental or ecological anthropology. In today's day and age, as we introduce this concept here, we're really thinking about this notion that humans are negatively impacting the environment and thus kind of an activist tendency that I think you start to see in the chapter on globalization emerges. So again, we talk about the Anthropocene as a term used to describe the period or the geological epoch or time in which the effects of human activities have altered the fundamental geochemical cycles of the earth as a result of converting forests into fields and pastures and burning oil, gas, and coal on a large scale. Really, I would add to that and say, as they offer here, any human activity that has a negative impact on climate, that has a negative impact on other species and animals. This stuff has been very politicized, and the right-wing media, unfortunately, I think has focused on anti-science when they've talked about some of this stuff, because I think there's a lot of political influences, if you will, or economic influences in our political system. And so maybe the coal industries or other industries that are leading to this kind of devastation that we're talking about this week, um, politicians maybe aren't willing to part ways with those kinds of industries and people and political action groups because those people often fund their campaigns. So you see the relationship back in this chapter to political anthropology and specifically our political system that is governed, of course, by economics, money, and contributions that a lot of us would say um, have really destroyed our political system because it's all about the very wealthy people protecting their interests and their corporate interests instead of everyday people really being offered the opportunity to live safe lives and equitable lives. And of course, in sociology, we talk about environmental racism to talk about how specific populations have been negatively impacted by these influences that we're discussing here in this chapter on sustainability, the Anthropocene, and environmental anthropology.
Now, Bruno Latour um, makes a note here that anthropology is uniquely qualified to think about these environmental crises by looking at the choices that human groups make by bridging the natural and social sciences, looking at contradictions between the cultural universals and the particularities. So I think it's a really great opportunity to delve into this and talk about the unique role that anthropology can have in this conversation. So again, when we talk about humans and the environment, to go back to those early traditions of ecological and environmental anthropology, 60s and 70s, stuff I always enjoyed reading, believe me, as an undergrad in this very class, cultural anthropology, we start to talk about how when humans lived, say, 10,000 years ago, the impact that they had was not necessarily on another part of the world. The impact was a local impact. Over time, as populations grew, as we had, as they say here, the first urban and permanent settlements, you do see an impact on the local landscape. And certainly, any society, even a small-scale society that overworks the land in its area, as we talked about in the subsistence chapter, can have a negative impact. What we're very concerned with, though, this week, in terms of both of these chapters, is the idea that what we do locally has a global impact. The giant garbage patch um, in the, what is it, in the Pacific Ocean has a major, um, you know, is a major conversation starter to talk about how our lifestyles and lifestyles, say, in China, because some of that garbage is coming from China, has an impact on our oceans because of all that garbage being pumped in there. And there's a great new technology that a guy invented that kind of um, automates collection of that garbage, processing of it, and turning it into everyday household goods and even like consumer goods like sunglasses and stuff. So there's a lot going on out there certainly to combat these influences that we're talking about. We've talked about Marshall Solins and his notion of affluence before in our chapters on subsistence and economics. And what I mentioned then was, is we really need to reorient this model that we have of consumption and neoliberalism as we're talking about this week and really think about more sustainable practices. That notion of the externality, you buy a product, you buy clothing for your body, or you buy a car, and you don't think about all the toxic byproducts as they talk about here, the carbon impacts, the impacts on the production chain, the distribution chain, the consumption chain, etc., then that is, is something to really consider. So those invisibilities, those externalities that we don't think about, we need to start thinking about. They talk about civilization collapse here among the Mayan cultures. And indeed, I would say we definitely could be in a situation where we're looking at the collapse of civilization. Diseases of modernization and globalization, including COVID-19 that we're dealing with right now, could be said to be having a major impact on us right now. And so we're seeing maybe the emergence of this idea of uh, global collapse. Not to get too pessimistic, but this chapter might, and the last chapter might induce a little pessimism, but also hopefully activism as I move through the end of the class and talk about public applied and uh, praxis focused anthropology. So the American Anthropological Association has released a statement on humanity and climate change that you can look at. It talks about here to recognize the contributions of global climate change issues, articulate new research directions, and provide the AAA with actions and recommendations to support the anthropological investigations of these issues. It could be theory, it could be course curriculum and so forth. So hopefully if we're engaging in this and we're studying this, whether we're looking anthropologically or reading a book like the work of Jared Diamond, for example, or any of the other great thinkers out there who write for a more popular audience, hopefully we're having opportunities to really engage with some of these issues and make some changes in our own lives and encourage others to also make some changes. So just to sum up environmental anthropology, as we talked about, it talks about anthropological perspectives that can be applied to public policy decisions like land use management or advocacy for urban um, minorities, indigenous communities, and other groups are often underrepresented. As I mentioned earlier with the study of sociology and race and environmentalism, we all often see forms of what we call environmental racism cropping up where certain populations are you know, getting hit with all the dumping of toxic waste and stuff that negatively affects them, leads to birth defects, and so forth. Cultural ecology is a very important concept, and Leslie White is certainly one of the giants that I read in both my undergraduate and graduate work in ecological and environmental anthropology. So looking at human evolution as a process of controlling the environment, 
of harnessing energy, of using technology was a real concern of Leslie White. And indeed, I think this idea of the harnessing of energy, the expending of energy, bringing in energy from calories is a really unique way to look at some of these things. And so I think Leslie White was certainly onto something when he modeled some of this um, ages ago. As well, Julian Stewart, equally important, talked about cultural ecology to discuss the ways in which cultures use and understand their environments. So we could clearly look at any number of cultures around the world and talk about their approaches to using the environment. I think in our cases, sometimes in the U.S., we're focusing more on this context of how consumerism is kind of taking over our environments and we're clear-cutting for us. We're doing that maybe for raising cattle, for meat production. We're also um, cutting, you know, small towns are kind of being turned into branded enclaves. Um, we have urban sprawl that you can talk about throughout the planet, really, but very specifically in the United States. So this perspective that we're talking about today is called materialism, which is a Marxist concept that talks about the way in which the social, human, and cultural practices are influenced by these basic economic or subsistence needs or issues. And this also has rooting in what we call processual archaeology that talks about the connections between past societies and their ecological systems. And then there was a whole movement led by others after this called post-processual archaeology, which is equally interesting, I encourage you to look at. So we've talked about Roy Rappaport's work in the past and Marvin Harris's work in the past, where we talked about subsistence and how certain if you will, rules about subsistence that could be rooted in cultural belief or religious belief were often tied to this notion here that they discuss of self-regulation. Maybe you want to control the population of the animal that you're raising, so there's a prohibition about eating or not eating that animal, and because of that you achieve what's called homeostasis or a balance of self-regulation between the humans living there, the species, and the ecosystem. It's all kind of in, in harmony if you can imagine this. And again, this idea among Hindu populations and cultures of eating or avoiding the, the eating of beef is very interesting because it could have certainly a religious context to it. But Marvin Harris said it's not simply about the cultural or religious side of things, but it's really about the economic and an ecological importance of cows in India. So it's interesting to bring in some of these materialist explanations to contrast or even I would say complement the cultural or religious or ideological explanations that we've talked about in the past. So really good case study to look at. When we get into ethnoecology, we're talking about how we as humans use the knowledge of plants, animals, and ecosystems and how that allows us to make some of these adaptations that could include what we call the homeostasis uh, earlier. So both Harris and Rappaport were interested again in some of the ritualistic connections and religious connections between the environment and various species like pigs and cows. And again, this allows you really to understand opportunities of how kind of the situation with species and the ecosystem locally in a culture makes sense given a lot of these issues we've been talking about in the past, uh, even going back to Clifford Geertz and the interpretive approach in anthropology or the symbolic approaches of say Victor Turner and making some connections here to, between the ecological subsistence issues and then the cultural or ideological religious issues that we've talked about in the past. So they get into different types of approaches to cultivation and horticulture, um, agriculture is also worthy of conversation. And then they talk here about plants, people, and culture, and specifically ethnobotany. So going to another culture like the Kayapo culture in Brazil and looking specifically at how specific um, plant or animal products are used in, for curative purposes or agriculture or subsistence purposes. I saw a documentary recently on hallucinogenic mushrooms, and it was talking about this whole notion of drawing on, say, hallucinogenics from traditional societies and then applying those to contemporary healing and psychological therapeutic contexts. They talk about this myth of the ecologically noble savage, this idea, and you even see it in uh, Jim Cameron's film with the Navi, this idea that they're connected to an exotic and vibrant natural world and they have to protect it from capitalism. And it's kind of interesting how Cameron deals with it, with this idea of these Marines coming in and wanting to uh, take control of the land and so forth. So I don't know what you thought of that film. It's such an old film and I, it's 2021 and I know he's going to make a 
sequel. Um, I've actually been to the world of Avatar at Disney and did a little bit of research on it. But it's kind of interesting that it's been this long to make those sequels to the film, which is not uh, the, the tendency if you look at other big transmedia enterprises out there. So you can, again, look at this notion of the ecologically noble savage and how it relies on this oversimplification of someone totally connected with their land. While many people out there, perhaps including ourselves, can be very closely connected to the land that we're a part of and its other species, we shouldn't romanticize and exoticize people just for the sake of maybe making a Western political argument about saving those people or saving their lands or species, non-human species in those lands. We can talk about land claims and mapping, and I think it gets very interesting when we talk about who controls the claim over um, particular land, and then what's happening in the contemporary scene in terms of people losing control, indigenous people and cultures losing control of their lands. Uh, there's a classic film by Werner Herzog called uh, Where the Green Ants Dream, and it deals with Aboriginal people in Australia who are denied a land rights claim in court because uh, the local government is basically like, no, those those rules, your own um, worldviews and cosmology is what we talked about in our religion chapter. They don't apply here. It's about the rule of law and the rule of this Western Australian government that governs what happens with the land. So land rights, a key issue for this contemporary scene that we're talking about. So in terms of political ecology here, there's a focus here on questioning science. And again, I would ask you here, why do people want in this era, whether it's COVID or global warming or climate issues, why do people want to deny science? And what is going on there when, when people are making these claims? They talk about revisionist environmentalist history. You can also look at in terms of the Amazon and people versus parks. So this is an interesting one, and we have some local connections to, to this among the Washoe, an indigenous uh, local Native American group, specifically with uh, Cave Rock. And you know, questions about who controls the land, uh, how should parks be used? And I think when you look at Yosemite, which is one of the great parks out there, but which is being dominated by tourism, even pre-COVID, uh, of course, you have to ask some questions about conservation and how we uh, control land and protect it. During the Trump administration, he uh, pulled back a lot of restrictions on protected land and opened up land to mining and to corporations and so forth. And certainly Trump was not by any means a pro-ecological or pro-sustainability president, very much as you might guess, a corporate pro-corporate president. Now, talking about sustainability, then we get into this idea of sustainable development. What does it mean? We encourage people to preserve rainforests instead of chopping them down, or we encourage them to use forms of uh, non-fossil fuel, renewable forms of energy, and so forth, such as their carbon footprint and our impact on this, uh, you know, this devastation that we're seeing with rainforests and other ecosystems around the world is minimized or even eliminated, which seems hard to believe. We can talk here about some research that was done here on ext extractive reserves in the Brazilian Amazon. So one of the authors here talks about this, and I think it's a very interesting case study, so I encourage you to read that over. We can also talk about the idea of political ecology. So specifically, we can try to connect ecology to political context. And they actually talk about here um, one particular study that happened in the Sierra, Sierra Nevadas here uh, close to Lake Tahoe. So it'd be an interesting study to look up. And if you ever want to, you can click on the footnotes at the end and look those studies up. They talk about clashes between environmentalists and maybe people that have more of a um, uh, you know, economic interest in mining or an economic interest in using lands in various ways that will not be sustainable. And then there's a discussion here of what we call eco-justice. So to go back to environmental racism, we can consider the race, gendered um, aspects of looking at environmental context. And then we can also talk about the issue of environmental justice. So eco-justice is this idea of trying to raise awareness about protecting ecosystems and their people and their species. We can also connect that to ecocide, which refers to environmental destruction, and ethnocide, which is cultural destruction. And unfortunately, in some cases, these could go together where people could be totally wiped out. There are stories of, there's one large dam project I remember in China that went up and it was going to uh, force people, indigenous people, um, from from this particular area. So we see these these cases in the news all the time, and very unfortunate cases 
that connect to environmental justice. We can also look at scientific and technology studies, which is a really huge approach that developed really in the late 1990s in cultural anthropology and has been super powerful going forward. So if you're ever interested in this, there's a lot of folks who study STS, science and technology studies, in anthropology departments across the United States and across the rest of the world. We can also talk about multi-species ethnographies. There's a really good case study about the mushroom that an anthropologist wrote years ago. And the multi-species ethnographies would be talking about not just humans in the picture, but other species. And Donna Haraway, Professor Emeritus at um, UC Santa Cruz, talks about dogs and the relationship between dogs and humans. And this idea of anthropomorphizing suggests that we sometimes need to look at non-human species, not as reflections of humans, but their own unique reflections, almost like applying cultural relativism, but to the multi-species level where we don't try to anthropomorphize um, non-human species. We can also apply anthropology in conservation practices. So I encourage you to look at these case studies. They include reforestation. They include looking at climate change, which I think is one of the big issues, issues out there right now. And indeed, some people, as I mentioned earlier, are saying COVID is specifically connected to both globalization and climate change. And then we can talk about anthropologists who work in conservation organizations and do what we call CRM, which is cultural resource management. And we often see this in archaeology, where archaeologists are trying to preserve sites and try to minimize the damage to sacred sites, heritage sites and archaeological sites that maybe are being destroyed because of a construction project. And there are specific laws out there, one that is called NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Repatriation Act, that specifically focuses on protecting and removing and safely storing and re- allocating, if you will, or giving back to the indigenous communities and the elders of those communities, human remains or cultural remains that might be discovered during the practice of, say, building a building or constructing a highway or a dam or whatever. So a lot to think about in this chapter. I just really encourage you, again, to make the connections between the two chapters that we're looking at this week to really understand kind of this picture of how the Anthropocene and the negative human impact on the environment does indeed, by all means, connect to globalization. Now let's look at some additional readings and media for the week as well. And what I'm very specifically trying to do here is to give you some additional context on globalization and the Anthropocene to really give you a sense of additional case studies that just might take you in some new direction. So looking at the taco and the deconstruction of the taco and how all the ingredients in the tacos you can see from this map here give you a picture of globalization of food production. So very interesting to consider. You can also look at this extensive study of globalization if you want to get a little more information about it. You can look at Arjuna Padre's original article that talks about the five scapes but in much more detail. So if you want a little more context and you're not quite gathering or understanding what the authors are talking about in our chapter, look at the article and that'll give you more. This is a really good article that discusses neoliberalism in some more depth and provides a critique of it. This is that case study on the Bolivian water crisis. And uh, I really encourage you to look at this, the economics of it and the global context of it. You can also look at the flip-flop as an interesting case study, not unlike the taco, in terms of how it expresses or explains globalization. Specific to the Anthropocene, you can look at Paul Stoller's work. And uh, this gives you just a context of why anthropologists started talking about this moment. There's a very specific case study here or a set of case studies in a journal uh, in Anthropology News. So you can check that out. This talks a little more about what we mean by this era. This discusses climate change in anthropology. And I thought this is an interesting context of looking at the future and maybe looking at some of those issues of um, how anthropologists and others are really concerned about the future that is out there or that is emerging as we have these concerns. Um, a couple of my, my own articles here. So you can look at my article on heritage and specifically I get into some of these issues that were discussed in both of these chapters, very specifically talking about how the uncertain future is leading us to asking new questions and concerns and, and raising controversies about how we preserve the past or the current moment in time. Uh, for example, I talk about the seed vault project that is happening. That's a pretty interesting example of trying to preserve a library, if you will, 
of all the uh, seeds of all the various plants around the world such that these plants can be grown back in the future. So a lot to talk about there. And then this is my chapter on the consumer public sphere. Very specifically, I'm trying to look at how social justice might converge with some of these um, consumption and lifestyle choices that we make. So be curious to see what you have to say about this. And I had to throw in one article here about coronavirus to kind of give you a global picture of that. So check out those additional readings for this week. I think there's some really great ones to uh, look at and to consider. Now also click on the media for week 10. You know, find some good examples. So an, a lecture by Arjuna Padurai, if you want to supplement your knowledge again of his concepts of the five scapes. A discussion of what neoliberalism is. A focus on the Bolivian water crisis, so check that out. Here's the flip-flop example as a video. You can also look at the reading of it. Here's a little more about ethnomedicine and how ethnobotany comes into play as we look at the knowledge of, say, indigenous cultures in the Amazon and how it could be applied to curing maybe some of these issues, even these diseases that we're dealing with today, like COVID. Here are a couple of videos here on globalization that you can consider, how globalization emerged as a field of study. Here's a bit on the Anthropocene, talking from different anthropological perspectives, including Bruno Latour, who's a very important figure in contemporary anthropology and who's discussed in their chapter. And then some Q&As on it. And then lastly, the work of Ulrich Beck, who wrote about the idea of risk society years ago when I was first studying anthropology at the graduate level. I remember we talked a lot about the work of Ulrich Beck and how he projected this idea that certain risks are emerging around the world. And I don't think he ever could have imagined what we're experiencing now in terms of COVID-19 here in 2021. So this will do it for week 10 here in Culture Anthropology. We're coming near the close of the class, so continue your readings and discussions. There's also a third paper coming up, and the paper, of course, focuses on concepts in the chapter and also looking at a specific website that you have to visit. So if any questions come up, please reach out. I'll be back with one additional video. That'll be our week 11 video to close out the class. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you soon.